I'm George Gallo, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free work. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London and discussing a story which crosses the Atlantic Ocean in a very big way, from Britain to the United States of America. I refer to the right royal rumpus over the interview given to Oprah Winfrey by Prince Harry and his American divorcee wife. I mentioned that last point because it's being said that this interview has triggered a constitutional crisis, a chasm in the royal family not seen since the last British royal wanted to marry an American divorcee. The abdication of the king in the 1930s was caused by the fact that the British government simply would not permit this marriage. Uh, that's, of course, water under the bridge. Not only did the British government welcome the marriage between Meghan Markle, an American actress, and our own Prince Harry, uh, the second son of the heir to the throne, Prince Charles, but we spent £40 million on their royal wedding. At the time, it looked like a fairy tale come true. The British have a commonwealth, 70% of which is black or Asian. Now we had a member of the British royal family of mixed racial heritage, claiming, of course, by her birthright through her mother to be a black actress. It looked wonderful. The pictures were very beautiful indeed, but it all quickly went sour. And anyone who's seen the Oprah Winfrey interview realizes the very serious damage that it has done to the reputation across the world, though not in Britain. In Britain, almost everyone, two thirds, back the Queen's side of the argument rather than Prince Harry and Meghan. But internationally, it can only have been very damaging especially the allegation that she was treated differently, that their children are to be treated differently on grounds of colour, on grounds of race. Now, to the rest of the world, especially in the Arab world, where there are lots of monarchies, this may seem of little moment. But in Britain and the United States, I promise you, it's a very big story indeed. I'm joined by a panel of distinguished experts, figures from the media and from politics, to assess what this story means. First up is Ken Livingston, a veteran, long-time Labour Member of Parliament, one of the biggest figures in the Labour Party over decades, and of course, twice Mayor of London. Ken. What's the lesson of this story? Not to marry American divorcees uh, or not to have a monarchy at all? Well, this is the problem of my... I've been a Republican all my life. I, I think... You look at kids growing up in the royal family at the centre of global attention, and so many of them end up screwed up or the sort of problems Prince Andrew's had recently and all that. I just don't think that should happen to kids. I think we should be like other countries and elect a head of state who's some distinguished old person who does it for a few years. I mean, imagine what it's like growing up in the royal family. Everything you do or say, and you're just in your early teens and it's all over the news. That's bound to be damaging. You say a distinguished old person, but there would be no uh, barrier, of course, to it being an undistinguished young person, like Tony Blair, for example. <laughs> there was a moment when Tony Blair might have become the president. You wouldn't have wanted that. Well, actually, I, I, I always think that Tony Blair wasn't really a politician at all. I mean, he, in all his times as a student, he never went to a single political event or meeting. I think he only got involved in the Labour Party when he fell in love with Cherie. She was totally caught up in it. That's the only reason he joined, because his politics weren't Labour at all. 
At best, they were don't know better than sure, being a but liberal. He, but he would have liked to be the president. He wanted to oh, be God, the yeah. president of Europe. <laughs> he, you see my point, that we have to have a head of state. Mm. We can have uh, an we unelected... Could have had you. <laughs> yeah, we could have had an unelected uh, and, uh, and um, hereditary one. Mm. But if you go down the road of having a president, you run the risk of a very divisive president well, indeed. That's the problem. If you elect somebody... And I, well, you actually look at the, the mayoral system in London now. I mean, the mayor takes every decision. I mean, they're not really answerable to the assembly. And so people could have come to me and said, I want to build this big shard development. And I could have said, just put £100,000 in my secret Swiss bank account. And one day we will have a mayor who does that. And so I, I'm not in favour of directly electing someone to run something. I think you should elect a council or a parliament and they have the ability to get rid of a leader who, you know, I mean, doesn't deserve to be there anymore. Whereas you're stuck with a mayor or a president to the end of their reign, basically. Jacques Arnold, uh, another, of your, forgive me, veteran parliamentarian, but a conservative parliamentarian and not a Republican like Ken, <laughs> but a monarchist. Um, Ken has a point, doesn't he, that uh, it's actually not a very healthy existence to grow up as a royal child? I think it does show the pressures that are put on that family, but significantly mm. uh, they are born and brought up <clears throat> and know how to cope. Uh, occasionally we get uh, disasters, uh, which we've seen, and the press have gone uh, terribly excited. I think in this particular case it's both a tragedy and a celebrity hoo-ha. The tragedy, of course, being uh, the prince himself, who showed himself to be very effective with his disabled uh, servicemen's charities, uh, his work... He served Africa. in the army, actually, in yeah. wars. Exactly. And uh, he seemed, seemed uh, really good as a member of the royal family uh, and looking ahead. The disaster occurred was when he came across this uh, young lady um, she is, throughout her life, very obviously determined to become a rich Californian celebrity and she'll sacrifice anything, first her own family and within a couple of years the family into which she married, uh, slinging all kind of accusations. The suggestion that the royal family is racist is absolutely remarkable when you think as far back as Queen Victoria and the Munchie. Uh, and then you spread it forward. Did you notice the officer who laid the Queen's wreath uh, at Westminster on Remembrance Sunday? A black officer in a, a, a top regiment serving the Queen as an ADC. The suggestion that the royal family is racist is just total nonsense. If you look at it over the years, uh, it's been very, very clear. Uh, and one of the most significant things is during all the politicians' ob obsession with Europe over 50 years, the Queen quietly carried on excellent work with the Commonwealth and thereby with a Commonwealth of many religions and many races. Uh, the overwhelming majority of British people uh, highly respect the Queen, uh, but she's extremely old. The question for monarchists like you is, are they going to be able to pull off a transition to uh, Prince Charles and then his offspring uh, where accidents like the one you uh, refer to, accidents of marriage, accidents of conduct, uh, are likely severely to disrupt that transition? No, the transition is actually uh, automatic. Uh, plans have been prepared uh, for the, uh, a succession. Um, a lot of dusting has gone down because we haven't had a succession since 1952. Uh, but it is all laid down in law and practice uh, and I think very quietly the whole setup is, <coughs> is prepared for the very sad day we lose the Queen. Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos, you're not a politician, you're a writer, an author, a commentator. I've no idea whether you're a monarchist or a republican, but as a non-politician, how do you view this rumpus? Well, I come at this from a very different angle. <clears throat> My own view is that the farcical discussions over the British royal family or Meghan Markle 
are actually a depressingly sad reflection of modern day Britain. I say depressingly sad because in Britain today there is a fixation amongst members of the British public about the narcissistic personal lives of the rich and powerful and celebrities. Instead of being fixated on the British royal family or Meghan Markle, there should be a fixation on, for example, the 14 million British people who live in poverty, the 4 million British children who live below the breadline, the 300,000 homeless people in the UK, the 2 million people in the UK who are dependent on food banks. Society should also be fixated on how the rights of women and children are now being systematically eroded. There should also be a fixation on how British culture and the British national identity are being eroded. But alas, the British public is more interested in the narcissistic uh, personal lives of the rich and famous. And when it comes to Meghan Markle, she made a very serious allegation that the British royal family is racist. My own opinion is that she's not naive and she's certainly not dense. If she really had strong convictions and strong principles, then she would have had nothing to do with the British royal family in the first place. My view is that she saw an opportunity to kickstart her career, to achieve global fame, and she has played this beautifully. Well, well look, I, I, I'll come back to you, Ken. Um, of course, the Queen is the head of state in many Commonwealth countries also. One of those is Australia, where there is a significant body of opinion, Republican, like Ken Livingston. <laughs> Alexandra Marshall is the young ambassador for the Australians for a constitutional monarchy movement. She's in Sydney, Australia. Let's hear what she has to say. Thank you very much for having it. It is a pleasure to be here. It won't be clear to many viewers overseas, so could you perhaps begin by explaining to the viewers what is the role of the royal family in Australia? Well, we have the royal family in Australia as a political system. It's not just a theatrical thing of castles and gowns and royals. It's actually a political mechanism that we got from the birth of our nation and our parent nation, which is, of course, the British Empire. And so... When Australia was federated, we made a, a choice to keep the constitutional monarchy that we have because Australian politicians believe that it was the most secure type of politics that we could possibly have. And so uh, we decided to go down that role. And in Australia, basically, it's a similar way to how it works in the UK, except that our head of state is an Australian. It's the governor general. And so our politicians have, uh, let's call it a safety net for democracy, whereas if they get a bit out of hand, which has happened once in the past, then the Governor General can dismiss a government and send the government back to election. And so I think in your term, it's the Queen, but in our it's the Governor General. Does it matter to most Australians whether the Queen or perhaps the King, soon to be, is the head of state? Well, so in Australia, we are predominantly a conservative nation. We have been since our federation. I think it's about 74% of the time we're governed by conservative government. But the monarchy has been popular on both sides of politics as far as the voters go, if not the politicians, from the beginning. And it has nothing to do with whether or not we have a queen or a king. It has to do with the stability that Australians like to have in their government. So we don't particularly like the theatre of our politics. We don't like our politicians very much. We'd rather we never heard from them except for election. We don't sign up to the whole American uh, show and dance they do. And so... Australians see their monarchy as a protection and a system that keeps their politicians in check. And so they don't really mind what the monarchy does. They enjoy it sometimes. They have more fun with the monarchy than at other times. But it's the political system that Australians value out of their monarchy. What was the effect of the Oprah interview on public perceptions about monarchy in Australia? Well, by all accounts, it's been quite a positive affair for the royals. We had uh, Meghan Markle take her Hollywood version of royalty and pit it against the actual royalty. And while Americans might be favouring the Meghan Markle drama, the places that actually have lived their monarchy and understand that monarchy is not about uh, Hollywood-style privilege and elite and excess, it's about service and duty. And all Meghan Markle has done is contrast herself against the system that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth has headed up 
for the longest monarch in history. And yet yeah, you can see the public opinion polls have done nothing but rise in Australia and the UK. Obviously, you're a supporter of the monarchy in Australia, but what are the main arguments used by Republicans in Australia against it? So I can explain it from two perspectives. The first one is that you will always have a percentage of the union movement, which is related to the socialist movement, which just do not like monarchies in general. Um, and we have to remember that the monarchies that the socialists don't like, which are the old European monarchies, are not the same political structure as the constitutional monarchy. And that is a big misunderstanding that we see even in Australian politics right now is most people are politically illiterate when it comes to how our political systems work. But then of course, we've got the group of uh, Republicans who tried to bring about the referendum in 1999. And they are led by the exact same group of people who are trying to bring about the Republican debate this time around. It's the Malcolm Turnbulls of the world. And most of them are led by politicians who were kicked out of politics last time and now looking for another run around. And the line that they use to sell the popularity of a republic, which I think is what you're getting at, is the idea of an Australian head of state. Now, as I said before, we do have an Australian head of state, but the narrative on the ground is that we do not. And so that's where the confusion comes from. That's where a lot of support comes from. But when push comes to shove, as you saw in the last referendum, it was only Canberra, the home of politicians, that ended up voting in favour of it. And finally, what are your views on a referendum in Australia about the monarchy? And if there was one, what's your prediction of what the results would be? So it is possible we will have another referendum because, as I said, the same kids who were there last time are pushing and agitating for another referendum. So we might get it, particularly if we get a Labor government in the next election that's coming up. But if we did, all the polls on the ground and the sentiment that we're seeing online, even among the young who are becoming the largest voting base, they still like their monarchy as a, as a whole, whether it's the idea of the royals and they like the new generation or it's the understanding of the political certainty. Australia is still predominantly in favour of their monarchy, regardless of what uh, the Republicans will say. So I would go, if I had to base it on a guess tomorrow, I would say we have a similar result to 1999. Ken Livingston, uh, a fair bit of uh, rewriting of history there. Uh, Australia existed before the British arrived, of course, uh, and uh, by one means or another got rid of most of yeah. the original Australians and kept the others in a rather Look, I'll tell you one really state. terrible thing. When we colonised Tasmania, the big island just to the south, the then British government paid the new settlers five pounds, this is 200 years ago, a lot of money, five pounds for the head of every native brought in. And over the next few years, it was 100% genocide. Now, we're not taught that when we're at school, are we? All that's covered up. That's a fact that every single Tasmanian mm. was killed. Yeah. Uh, the same didn't exactly happen in Australia, but it's a pretty miserable yeah. story. Uh, but that young woman seems confident that, uh, that they'll win a referendum to continue the monarchy. Do you think, presumably on the demise uh, of the current Queen, mm. that there should be a referendum in Britain uh, on whether to continue with monarchy? And if there was, what would the result of it be? Well, I think that's interesting because the Queen has served our country, and although I'm a Republican, I have a real respect for her. She's always put her country first. Um, I was particularly surprised when Mrs. Satter introduced the, the bill to abolish the Greater London Council. And I get a phone call from the palace saying the Queen would come, like to come and open the Thames Barrier. Thatcher was furious about that. So I, uh, we know they didn't get on terribly well, the Queen and Thatcher. And so, I mean, I think if we had a referendum um, <coughs> after the Queen's death, it could very well be, because I don't think Prince Charles is perceived in the same way as the Queen is. I think we could see a, a switch to having a republic, and certainly I'd be voting for that. Jacques, do you think there will be a referendum, should be a referendum? If there were, what would the result be? I don't think there should be a referendum. I think our system is quite fine. It is a matter for Parliament, not for a referendum, I think. Uh, in respect to Prince Charles, when the public look at him, they can see his absolute de de dedication to the role uh, and following in his mother's footsteps uh, in that way. And if just to look at uh, Prince Charles, his wife, his elder son, throughout this pa pandemic, they have underlined yet again uh, the value of having the monarchy uh, as a rallying point and a 
a simple point of saying thank you to those many millions who've gone the extra mile to care for people in the hospitals, emptying ru rubbish bins, the police, etc. You're confident of Prince Charles's popularity, but the opinion polling doesn't indicate that. There's a considerable gap between the standing of Prince Charles and the standing of his mother. He does seem something of an odd fellow to most British people, I think. No, I don't think so. I, I, I think the, imp the important difference is the Queen has been there as sovereign for all this long time. He has been the understudy and the heir waiting longer than any heir has in history. Uh, so it's very much a different thing. But when it comes to deciding, they will be looking at the new King Charles and the new Prince of Wales. And the new Prince of Wales and his wife have really impressed uh, with their service, particularly during the, uh, during the COVID episode. Maybe they should skip Charles and go straight to <laughs> this new uh, Prince of Wales. More uh, about this story. Yes, go on. On, on that, I, I, I think it will be extremely unfair to skip. Uh, you've got a, a case of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and their very young children. By skipping, we're putting the yoke and the load onto them uh, very early in their family life, uh, which will put the kind of pressures you were talking about uh, on the children uh, very much on theirs. That's exactly what happened to the Queen, of course, and you say she was a success. She coped. She but... became the Queen before I was born. Just imagine that. There'll be more on this story after the break, but we'll look more deeply at the issues of hereditary power also. Stay tuned. <laughs> You're watching Kali Mahora with me, George Galloway, in London for Al Maidin Television, talking about the biggest royal story for, well, I don't know, decades at least, maybe in the last 70 years, we haven't seen a challenge to monarchy like the one posed by the interview that the Prince Harry and his wife Meghan Markle, the American divorcee actress, gave to Oprah Winfrey. To call it explosive uh, is really to understate it. We'll be looking also at the issue of hereditary power in theory. And it's that, Dr. Marcus, I want to ask you about. You heard from that young Australian woman, born long, long, long after the Queen came to power, the feeling that people have of continuity, of stability, of the national culture that you referred to earlier, there's something in that, isn't there? Uh, that presidents are here today, gone tomorrow. They might be bad eggs. They might just get in and no more. They might get up to mischief, interfering with the legislature and so on. Why not have monarchy? There are many countries in the world that do, including probably most of the countries watching this program. Well, let me show my cards, so to speak. Um, I'm not a monarchist. I am a very strong supporter of an elected head of state, um, in this case, uh, a president. I oppose the British royal family as I oppose all monarchies in the world on the basis that a monarchy is based on elitism, it's based on patronage, and it should, ha it should have nothing to do uh, in the modern world. And I do not accept the argument, if we're talking in the context of the British royal family, that they are bastions of British culture, bastions of the British national identity. I believe they serve the House of Windsor. I believe they serve themselves. We obviously are aware of the British Empire, but that was not an empire for the ordinary British man and woman. That was an empire for the House of Windsor. And I'm very well aware of the terrible crimes of the genocides committed uh, by the British Empire. Um, but in today's world, who is blamed for that? Well, it's not the British royal family 
which is at the heart of the British establishment, it's the ordinary British man and woman who are blamed for that. And in my opinion, that is absolutely intolerable. And when we hear the talk about uh, a constitutional monarchy, let me say this, that concept is traditional deceptive language of British officialdom because no one in their right mind should believe that the British monarchy has lost its absolute power which it enjoyed for centuries. The British state was very well aware in the, mid, uh, the middle of the 19th century that Europe was changing and in order to safeguard the British monarchy, the British monarchy had to be seen as evolving. That's why a prime minister came into place. But the British royal family, in my opinion, they have nothing to do with British patriotism. Well, that's a splendid enunciation of the Republican case, but uh, you say that it's nothing to do with British patriotism, but you'd accept, I think, uh, that the great majority of British people don't agree with you. I fully agree with that. I believe if a referendum was held, uh, on the future of the monarchy, something I would support, providing it would be intelligent, mature and informed, and given the standards of British mainstream media, that is not going to happen. But yes, if a referendum was held, uh, a vast majority of British people would vote in favour of keeping, preserving the monarchy. But why would they do that? Because there has never been a sensible, intelligent and informative discussion on the actual nature of the British royal family. Well, look, you talked about uh, empire. Of course, Ireland was for many centuries a part of uh, the British Empire. Uh, let's talk with Fra Hughes, who uh, travelled to Gaza with me, in fact, in a relief convoy. Haven't seen him for a long time, but he's a, a, a journalist and a commentator and an author. Fra, let's have the view from across the Irish Sea. Thank you, thank you. Does Britain need a monarchy? Um, it's a very interesting question because it depends on which side of the debate that you're going to come down on. I don't believe that any country needs a monarchy. In fact, I would be very much in favour of a republic. Uh, the monarchy does play a role in the political discourse in Britain. But uh, personally, uh, I would much rather have a republic with an elected uh, president, uh, because then anyone who would be the titular head of the country uh, could be from any ethnic uh, minority. So it wouldn't have to be uh, a white uh, leading the country. It could be anyone in civil society uh, born in Britain, uh, but from any ethnic background and from any of the previous uh, British occupied colonies. For the benefit of our international audience, could you explain? why in Northern Ireland there is a significant anti-monarchy feeling? Uh, the history of Ireland with Britain and the royals is quite uh, complicated. In many respects, some of the first invasions and military occupations of Ireland were led by British monarchs. And if we go back to the time of Queen Victoria, uh, we had the famine in Ireland now, this was due to the potato blight. Uh, two million people either died or emigrated from the island of Ireland. Uh, and it was proved and has been proved by historians that there was plenty of food in Ireland in order to feed the people. But for profit, they took cattle, they took potatoes, they took wheat from Ireland, uh, exported it to England uh, and Britain for as cash crops to make money for the landlords and the elite in Britain and allowed a genocide of sorts to envelope the entire uh, island of Ireland and many, many, many people uh, that's still in our, our folk memory. Uh, and while a lot of people have forgiven what's happened in the past, uh, we will not forget it, but we actually have a divided society here in the North of Ireland. So many people in the North of Ireland are pro-monarchy simply because they are pro-British uh, and the Queen is the titular head uh, of the Church of England and many Protestants in Northern Ireland who are colonial descendants uh, from the plantation of Ulster uh, in and around the 1600s. They have an allegiance to Britain and an allegiance to the Queen and the monarchy, 
but uh, many Republicans uh, all over Ireland uh, are for a reunification of Ireland and not to have uh, the Queen to have anything to do with uh, our sovereignty and our nation going forward. Supporters of the monarchy would say that uh, the existence of a royal family generates income and power for the United Kingdom. What's your view on that? The monarchy generates wealth and power for itself. I've heard this uh, excuse, which I believe it to be, uh, propagated many, many, many times. And, uh, and the other issue that I have when I talk about wealth and power connected to the monarchy is that uh, a lot of the costs associated with the monarchy, including the renovations being done at a cost of like over, over 30 or 40 million pounds to Buckingham Palace is coming out of the public purse. So my taxes are being used to pay for upgrades at Buckingham Palace. It's being used to pay for visits throughout the Commonwealth by members of the royal family. It's to pay for their protection. Uh, and you know, when, when I look at the royal family and I look at some of the, the people that they have associated with over the years, I mean, it's a very, very, very bad history of connections maybe with uh, Nazism uh, in and around the Second World War. There's connections with Prince Andrew, uh, questions over his relationship with uh, Epstein. There were questions as to whether or not Prince Charles had extramarital affairs during the course of his marriage to Princess Diana. And then there are questions over how she died in a tunnel in Paris. So, you know, I don't want my money and my taxes, while Northern Ireland remains part of the United Kingdom, to go towards funding a family that I feel has brought uh, disrespect upon not only the name and the family of Windsor, but upon Britain as a nation. And finally, how do people in Northern Ireland view the Oprah Winfrey interview? No, I don't think it's a distraction. I think there's enough uh, going on in the world that uh, you don't really need any distractions from what's happening. I personally feel that uh, going by you know, the interview itself and how Meghan Markle uh, came across and uh, Harry, uh, Prince Harry came across, is that there must be continuing racism or, or, or a racist element to how she was treated within the royal family. And she claimed that she was never really made to feel as welcome as some of the other uh, people who married into the royal family. I personally think that Meghan Markle, uh, well, well, I can understand that she has an issue that she wanted to find some form of closure with. And if she couldn't get it with the royal family privately, I think she's trying to get that closure publicly and explain publicly why her and Harry have left Britain uh, in order to base themselves in the United States of America. But I feel that also there's an, there's an element of self-promotion in this because wh why would anyone go on, on national television to air their laundry in public uh, around something as sensitive as this race issue. Jacques Arnold, uh, the viewers won't know, so we must tell them that all three of us regularly had to swear allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen and all, all her heirs and successors, or we would not have been allowed to sit down in the Parliament to which we'd been elected. We wouldn't even have been paid our salary, <laughs> though that's a less important thing, <laughs> of course. Um, the floor is yours. You're the only monarchist on the <laughs> panel. State your case for monarchy as, as a principle, as a concept. I think the most important thing in this day and age of democracy is we have an elected parliament uh, much to the non-plussing of the electors, you and Ken <laughs> and I were elected to Parliament, and it is that Parliament which has the, the effective political power. Where the monarchy comes in is to act as a referee, a ring holder for the politicians, and as a focus of the patriotism of the nation and the fostering of voluntary activities. And they do this remarkably well. Uh, and you would perhaps have found it rather difficult to swear allegiance to a President Thatcher or to Ken to a pre President Blair. 
Uh, we don't have that Good problem. point, you know. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have that problem. We have a monarch that our history has handed down to us. Uh, the danger, of course, if we end up with a, an inadequate person, but in history these matters have been uh, coped with. But the important point is the monarchy is not party political. To this day, nobody knows what the Queen's political views are. Uh, she has been in incredibly discreet, and you can even say that to, for, to her about her heirs and successors, because they know the system will only work if they are totally politically impartial. And that's what we've got. If we went down the presidential route, uh, ambitious people like Tony Blair would go for it. As you said, he would want it to be president of Europe, but that, he fouled that up as well. Uh, the facts of the matter are uh, that we have a system that is holding the ring and holding it very effective and attracting the support uh, of patriotism and voluntary goodwill activities which they foster. And that's immensely valuable and to throw it out for a clapped out ambitious politician seems the height of madness. He's got a point, doesn't he, Ken? Well, we've been lucky. As I've said, this Queen has been totally loyal to Britain. She's put the interests of the people of Britain first. But, I mean, when you have an inheritance and that's, you know, the next one comes along, they can be corrupt, they can be completely murderous. You look back and think, I mean, under the, the reign of Prince, uh, under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, we killed millions of Irish people. And that was when she was running the country. Why? Because they were Catholic and we were switching to Protestant. And now we live in a world where I mean, the power has shifted from the royal family to the, the, the prime minister and parliament. And, and thank God for that. I mean, we've been lucky with this queen, but we could be very... I mean, I, I'm not a great fan of Prince Charles because I remember at the beginning of the... 2008 mayoral election, he made a speech denouncing me, I mean, which actually Boris was delighted with. And so I, I do think he's much more likely to be involved in meddling in politics than the Queen's been. That is the point. We've been lucky, but we might not always be lucky. And we might have many years of a dysfunctional mm. uh, hereditary head of state. Uh, I remember that Prince Charles denounced Ken. Many people have denounced Ken, even me, <laughs> from time to time. But it's no part of Prince Charles's responsibility to get into party politics like that. And you might not like his politics. He might turn out to be far too liberal for you, far too green for you, far too intrusive for you. What are you going to do then? Uh, the whole point of the monarchy is, is they do not express opinions. The, the sovereign doesn't. I'm surprised to hear what you say about the Prince of Wales. Uh, and, but obviously uh, you... He's always writing letters to ministers. Oh, yes, uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, but, but going back to your original point, if we ended up with an inadequate monarch, it does rest with Parliament to uh, do something about it. Uh, the, the, the slightly slight farce of this uh, current setup uh, is if Parliament passed a bill for the execution of the sovereign, she would be bound by precedent to sign it. Uh, so if Parliament got upset uh, uh, about the quality of a monarch we ended up with, I, I think through the usual channels of Parliament with the palace, uh, these matters would be sorted out as they were way back in 1936, when a total inadequate, distracted monarch had to go because he wasn't doing his job properly. Many of the people watching this will be living in monarchies. Some of them won't have parliaments, uh, at least not uh, elected parliaments in the way that we know it. Dr. Marcus, are you against all monarchies <clears throat> or can you see the argument perhaps especially in countries that are, as it were, far less long-standing than ours, states that only came into being in the 1960s, having this continuity, this leading royal family guiding their affairs. 
All of this, of course, is assuming that the British royal family does not play the cardinal role in British policy making. As I said moments ago, uh, the uh, concept of a constitutional monarchy might sound appealing in theory, but in practice, the British royal family still play the cardinal role. And yes, I believe that the British royal family is as rancid as the Saudi royal family. I do not buy the argument that uh, if a country... Harsh. The Saudi royal family cut people's heads off in public. <laughs> well, let's have a look what uh, past British monarchs did around the past. world. There's never been oh, any... Queen Elizabeth has but, never, but there's uh, never cut been, anyone's but head But there's off. never been oh. any apologies by the Queen for what her ancestors did. There's certainly never been any apologies from the Queen. I think that speaks wonders. Well, actually, they cut each other's heads off. Uh, the Mary, Queen of Scots, was <laughs> beheaded by... Uh, Queen Elizabeth I. My point is that the Queen is not an innocent, harmless little old lady that you would find at a bus stop. She is one of the most powerful and, in my opinion, one of the most ruthless leaders in the world. Oh, I think that's a bit extreme, <laughs> Jack, don't you? I th I'm afraid I'm a bit gobsmacked. Having served in the House of Commons, I know that the buck stops there. Uh, we all watch politics uh, and we can frequently see when the buck is not picked up with and run. Uh, but nevertheless, our elected representatives uh, take the political decisions and the virtue of the monarchy is it's not involved in politics and shouldn't be. I've served the Queen twice, once as a Member of Parliament and once as a waiter. <laughs> I, uh, uh, on her state visit I thought to... that was John Prescott. No, uh, on her uh, state visit to my hometown. I was the head wine waiter uh, who <laughs> served her. Uh, when I told her this, she affected to remember, but I doubt that she <laughs> did. Uh, Ken, I think Dr. Marcus is quite wrong uh, in his characterization uh, of the Queen, but they, they have a rum ancestry, don't they? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I wouldn't go all that way um, on denouncing the Queen. I, but you look back at our history. I mean, so many of our kings and queens were murderous and took a terrible toll on life, and not just here. I mean, you look recently at the scandal of uh, Saudi Arabia authorising the murder of a journalist and so on. All of that. I mean, if you put so much power in one person's hands, you're going to have terrible abuses by some of those people. But the, the, the point that Jack makes is that we've got a constitutional monarchy. Exactly. We've got a parliament that would never, one hopes, countenance and the, Saudi uh, still the, uh, the murder of uh, yep. uh, Jamal Khashoggi that, we, uh, that you refer to. Uh, haven't we got the best of both worlds? We've got a democratic parliament and we've got a hereditary monarchy? Yeah, I think, I mean... We've been really lucky. We've been born and brought up in an amazing country where things got better all through our childhood. It didn't carry on quite like that under Thatcher and Blair. But the simple fact is most other nations around the world are much more scary places to live than we are here. But that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't think forward to the fact, should we continue with such an outdated structure of an inherited head of state? Because you will one day get another nasty one. It is a bit childish, isn't it? Wouldn't you at least concede that's a bit ruritarian? It's a bit fairy taleish that your head of state is determined by uh, primogeniture in the beginning. I mean, if Princess Anne had been born before Prince Charles, she would not have become the monarch. Hmm. But that is just the point. The monarchy is always evolving, always responding to public opinion and the way the country is going. Uh, that is why the uh, order of succession rules were changed to, to give women parity with men uh, in the succession. Uh, at every stage, Britain progresses and the monarchy progresses. Uh, there was talk about the murderous activity of some of her predecessors in centuries gone by. Undeniable. Yes, they, uh, Shakespeare himself uh, charted. Totally undeniable. It was a case of absolute monarchy, but it and reflected what was done in those particular ages. It's very interesting to note that the monarch monarchies headed into the First World War, those that were absolute uh, and inflexible, broke be it the Empire of Russia, of Germany, of Austria. And what, what happened to the British? They changed the name of their dynasty because, of course, they had a Germanic <laughs> origin. And on they went, uh, changing the laws and the practices 
in accordance with the age, ever more constitutional monarchy. And we have all served in Parliament under that constitutional monarchy, which, as I pointed out, could take drastic steps if necessary. Of course, the First World War didn't actually have to happen because three of these kings were all grandsons mm. of the British Queen Victoria. They yeah. could have sorted it all out. Two. Two of them. The King of England and the, King, and the Emperor of Germany. And what about the he, Russian? He was a cousin. A cousin, okay. <laughs> Two grandsons and a cousin. They could have sorted it out over Christmas dinner uh, at uh, Buckingham Palace, couldn't they, Ken? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, literally, when you look back, the, the implications of that, the millions and millions who died, I mean, it was bizarre. I mean, because it wasn't a great, a, a great issue like the beginning of the Second World War was. I mean, that was one you had to fight because it's one of the greatest evils in human history. It's but, true that the royal families of absolutist countries are a different beast mm. from uh, a constitutional monarch. Exactly. I'm struggling with uh, other examples. I suppose there's Go the on. Dutch mm. have a constitutional monarchy, although mm. one of the queens of the Netherlands married an SS officer, which wasn't the best <laughs> PR. No, you're, totally, you're totally wrong. Am uh, I? Yes, uh, um, the, uh, Prince Bernhardt was no SS officer, if you think of him, and maybe you're going back to uh, uh, Amina's cousin. I'm going back to the, to the grandmother, I think. It was long before, long before the Nazi regime at the time, anyway. Well, look... Or you're, you're perhaps referring to Prince Bernhardt, who was a, Ge a minor German princeling, uh, but he was not involved. <laughs> He wasn't uh, in the Nazi party? No, not in the slightest. He was a Dutchman by marriage, and rather like our own Duke of Edinburgh, who was a Greek prince, uh, he was absolutely involved and loyal to his country of marriage. Well, I'll take your word for that. If I have slighted the Dutch royal family, <laughs> I uh, apologise. It's not as I remember it, and my wife is Dutch, but I could be wrong. Uh, I know what you're talking about. You do? Uh, Prince Philip's uh, had had four sisters, and some of them served in Nazi roles because they were Germans. Yes, no, I, I wasn't confusing it with that, but but in a way, we've stumbled into one of the problems mm -hmm. uh, that when you're lucky, as we've been, I think we're all agreed. Maybe Dr. Marcus not, but <laughs> you can be unlucky. Oh yes, uh, the the people who come to office. Uh, by hereditary means, they could be anything. They could be anyone. They could marry anyone, They're... as Prince Harry has done. Do you accept that uh, Prince Harry has married unwisely, Ken? No. I mean, I'm totally in defence of his ability to be able to marry a woman of mixed race. And this is... Uh, of mixed is... race, yes, but this particular woman, even Dr Marcus, thinks that she has been uh, opportunistic in no, seeing... No. Uh, uh, the possibility of becoming a global figure. No, I mean, I think the defining thing about her is the remarks she made about someone in the royal family asking what's going to be the colour of your baby when it's born. But what's That's wrong with that? That's unacceptable. But why is it unacceptable? I have five mixed-race children. Mm. I dare say all of my in-laws wondered, perhaps aloud, uh, what the children would look like of our uh, marriage. Well, look, why I've is it been... racist to wonder... Well, if what, I, what the children are going to look like. If I'd been going out with a black woman in the 1960s, the whole street would have talked about it. My grandchild now is of mixed race. No one's ever mentioned it at all. I think we have moved a lot. Precisely. We've got a lot better as a nation. The, the racism that was endemic when I was growing up after the Second World War, where I would have thought the majority of people were racist. You had people saying, you know, a black person's brain is smaller than a white person's brain. Or people saying, we shouldn't allow any more black people to come here, even though they're part of our empire, all that. But we have dramatically improved. And I think, I mean, for politicians like us, you've got to keep fighting to push that on better, not just challenging racism, but homophobia and all the other um, unpleasantness. And you can Last word to the monarchist. <laughs> and you can briefly. You can do if if you want to in Parliament. Mm. But as you were talking about the evolution of opinions in mm. Britain and in, in, in those particular regards, just as much we've had evolution of our monarchy. Mm. Uh, and that is the most important point. 
that we have a monarchy that is above and separate from politics. Uh, monarchs don't have to go into politics to create a, uh, a, a public interest in order to win themselves election to be monarch. And that is the greatest strength of the monarchy, provided they always remember their duty it is to be politically impartial, keep well out of politics, and act as a rallying point for the nation and an encourager of voluntary, voluntarism in this country. And we have a lot of wonderful voluntary organisations which the royal family are rather good at supporting. Well, that's our discussion on the British royal family. Your royal family, of course, might be quite different to all of this, better or worse. That's a matter for you. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kalimahora for Al Maidin Television. Thank you for watching. Oh.